Well, if you'd like, go ahead and um, open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. If you've got an outline, um, if you didn't, maybe somebody can get one to you. It's the first section, so it's not a lot in the outline itself as far as details, what we're going to cover. So we're going to look at the, uh, some of the historical context, because I think it's important for us to uh, keep it into perspective and in understanding the writer. I mean, even the introduction, when you think about it, the introduction is something that when you start to sit down and to pen a letter, you already have an idea of why you're writing it. You already have this idea of a plan. And so with Paul, you can see, even in the introduction, some concepts that he's bringing out that are going to tie in throughout the theme of this letter. So let's look at the church itself, because I think this plays into an important part about why he's writing this letter. There's a lot of theories, um, but it's very different. This letter is not your typical letter that Paul writes. Most letters that Paul would write average 1,300 words. Do you know how long this one is? 7,000. 7,000 words. It's also written to a church that he had nothing to do with when it came to it being established. The third thing is, he really wants to go there, and he can't. He's sitting in Corinth for about four months. He's close. You know, you'd say, Paul, go. You want to go. But he has a mission. He's, he's got something he's got to accomplish. So he has set forward a plan to go back to Jerusalem, and he's been entrusted with money to take back for those Christians in Judea that are suffering from a famine. But in that plan, a part of his situation, he says in this letter that he is going to go back, and then from there, he will then come to Rome. From Rome, his plan is to then go, and then go up and take the gospel further. Now, at this time in Paul's life, he has already accomplished everything that he could possibly do when it comes to evangelizing Asia Minor, which is Turkey, our modern-day Turkey. I mean, he's even moved over into Greece and has already evangelized up and down the coast of Greece. What's left? So there's some people that believe that one of his writings of this letter is to kind of introduce himself, is to kind of establish a new base camp, a place to launch from, to go on into Europe. Because he used Antioch. He used Antioch um, of Presidia that he would go back to and spend time from, and then from there he would go out and launch into another mission, journey. But that doesn't really fit either. Um, it's not necessarily an introduction letter. He doesn't go into that. It doesn't have the same type of format. It doesn't actually even cover many aspects of the other letters that he wrote. He doesn't discuss the resurrection. He doesn't discuss what you would call eschatology, which is the end times. He doesn't talk about the resurrection. These are all topics that he wrote about in all his other letters. There's something about this letter that has fascinated me that why Romans? So those relationship thoughts made me think about the composite of the church itself. How did it start? What's its origins? Well, we really don't know. There's nothing historically outside the Bible that establishes that one individual traveled there and then that person then baptized and created a group of Christians that became a church. At this point, honestly, when we write this, we find out there's a church in Rome. <laughs> This is the first time we find out. Paul writing a letter to Romans. It's like, oh, there's a church there. Other than that, if you'd have never wrote this letter, it would have been probably as many churches that did exist that never got a letter from Paul. They got a copy of the letter, but wasn't written directly. He's not dealing with problems that they're having. Or is he? Now, he doesn't know them. He had a very personal relationship with all the other churches. He knew people there. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? I mean, when you know somebody face-to-face -face and you sit down with them and you have dinner and stuff and you, you work together and you strive together, you get beat together, you bond differently from those that are apart from you that you've never seen. Now, what do they know of him? Well, they've heard this is, this is you know, he's about 15 years of 
evangelizing the Asian minor continent. Um, he, they know about his history pretty thoroughly. We know that there's Jews that are traveling back and forth. We know that Paul has come into contact with Priscilla and Aquila. They are from Rome in Acts chapter 18. And that they were run out of Rome. That's an important point. Hold on to that. So he's receiving information about them. He knows about them very well. So how and who was the composite of the cultural and relationship of what Roman church was? And there were phases, just like every church. Every church goes through generational changes, cultural changes, depending on migration, immigration, different factors, economy, jobs changing, different cultures come in and go. The composite of the church changes. Changes the church dynamic, doesn't it? Quite a bit. Just the evolution of our generation changing has changed this church a lot. This is not the church of my grandpa. <laughs> literally. I mean, no, I mean it. Literally. It's, it's not. It, we don't think the same. I, I don't have the same culture from the 1960s that they had when they started these churches in this area. So what you have is the source that almost all scholars agree upon is the fact that this church was started by Jews who came from Jerusalem. You remember that the Jews would travel there during the feast days. They'd try to get the big, the big ones. And uh, atonement, uh, Passover, Pentecost. So the ones that were there for Pentecost, what happened then? You know, Pentecost was the day of, of, of the law coming. Passover was when Jesus was crucified. We know that there were thousands that were converted. And they were all staying there until when? Very historical moment was when Stephen was martyred. And then we read there in Acts where they dispersed. They all went home. So when they go back, they took this gospel message. And this is probably the source of where this church started. So who were they? Well, these were the very righteous Jews. Now we know by looking at the other letters of Jews that were becoming Christians, they were struggling with the idea of introducing this new gospel message with the doctrine of, of, of Mosaic law. How do you reconcile that? We know that they had some people that were coming right behind Paul as early as five to seven years trying to teach that you need circumcision. So I'm sure that they had some struggles in Rome with these Christians who went there and were now establishing a new church. So the church to begin with was Jewish. I'm sure that they were just like Paul. They went to the synagogues. And from there, they contacted the most righteous of righteous, you know, that were dedicated, and they listened, and they became Christians. So the church origin initially were Jews, Jewish Christians. But eventually, like all the churches, and we can, you know, this is a, really a safe conclusion because the pattern's the same at, with all the churches, was that they started out primarily Jewish, and then the Gentiles came in, and they became a Jewish Gentile. Now look at the progression. I've got that listed up there in a very specific order. First, the Jews come in and they establish the church. And then Gentiles are added with them. Now, just like a new member in our congregation that's only been with us about six months versus somebody who's been here 20 years. Now, we don't say we got seniority, but they tend to have a little more influence, don't they? Than somebody who just started worshiping with us or just became a Christian. So we know that the, the influence and, and the control and such was very strong towards the Jewish Christians dominating probably the Gentiles. Now remember, the Gentiles, they didn't have that heritage. They, they didn't know Mosaic law. And, and they surely didn't know Isaiah and the prophets and the, and the Psalms. And so it was extremely useful to have a Jewish Christian teaching them and connecting it together because they didn't have a Bible. That inspired people with them. And so you, it was very needful to have the Jews lead, be the leaders spiritually among these new Gentile Christians. Then you have the church turns into a Gentile church. And this is where I think we see something start to develop that has been missed for a long time. Is why? So it goes from a Jewish church to a Jewish Gentile church back to a Gentile church, and then a Gentile Jewish church. Now, you can look at that simply and go, hmm, like I just said, Jewish first, why? 
Well, they know the law. They have a connection to it. Gentiles become spiritually aware and they mature. And then all of a sudden, something happened. We're going to get to that. To where then, it was Gentiles. And they are the ones who had become spiritually strong and the dominating. And there were no Jews in the church. Then the Jews come back. And now you have a problem. You have a problem. And I think this is where we're going to see. Emperor Claudius, after Tiberius had died, was kind of an interesting emperor, probably one of the better ones. Um, ends up being poisoned by his wife, and his wife ends up helping Nero become, yeah, that guy, um, emperor, who then ends up murdering her, kills her. Yeah, that was a good choice, huh? <laughs> wife. <laughs> but Claudius, while he is ruling during this time, around 49 to 59 AD, Paul is about doing his missionary journeys and establishing churches there. Now that church in Rome, though, while they're converting people, there's a fight that develops. Just like everywhere Paul went, what would happen? At first, people would become excited. They would accept the gospel. A lot of the Jews in the synagogues would become Christians. And then all of a sudden, you get this pushback from the other Jews who would refuse it, and they'd become violent, and they'd become confrontational, and then Paul would have to leave town. But they would then develop the next progression of the churches was this conflict. This happened in Rome. And it became very disruptive. And so Claudius decided, no, no. I want the Jews out of here. Now, to a Roman, there was no difference between a Jew and a Christian. All they saw it is like a denomination. The way we say Christians, but you have Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, all of the different ones. To an atheist, Christian. They, they don't look at the subset. That's what we have starting, was you had Christians and Jews that were fighting. And as far as they were concerned, the Romans, it's the Jews. The Jews are causing all this problem. So Claudius says, I want them out. This is why Priscilla and Aquila run into Paul that in Corinth, because they had been forced to leave. So what did that leave in Rome? That left just the Gentiles. So they're running the church. Everything's fine. And we see that historically, uh, Suetonius writes and records this. As he's writing the history of the emperor um, Claudius, he writes, Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, which almost all scholars believe that they're saying Christ, he, the emperor Claudius, expelled them from Rome. So now, when they're gone, it's only a Gentile church. But after Claudius dies, we don't know exactly when. I mean, well, we know when he died, but we don't know exactly when, but the Jews are allowed to return under Nero. Now, I've heard some make a statement that because of the business orientation and that they were involved in certain levels that were helping, were very helpful in their business dealings, that they were allowed to come back because... It helped the city of Rome and what they were doing. That's just something I had read. I have nothing to substantiate that beyond just that that was something that I had read that said that. It's possible. So that helps to explain this evolution that's going on within the church itself. And it also helps to explain some of the reasons possibly that he did write this. Like I said earlier, I kind of introduced the idea that he wrote it because he was introducing himself, that he's going to eventually start going into Europe, but it doesn't fit. He, he's not trying to evangelize them like he does some of the initial churches. Like I said, he left out a lot of doctrinal things that he always would mention in all his letters. He does not mention them in this one. So that helps us to now understand a larger theme that's weaved through this entire book that's important. You remember I always say context, 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 context. This is a context issue. If we don't understand some of the motivation behind him writing this and the fact that it's seven, over 7,000 words, almost three times the size of a letter that he would normally write, we're missing the flow. 
And if you look at your outline, you'll see that in those sections, the first section goes through and it, it defines the problem. And then it comes in, and there's a section in there that seems to, that we go to that gets pulled out. It's 9 through 11. Chapters 9 through 11, a lot of times, is being pulled out, and people go to it. And then after 11, they stop. Because what you see is Paul doctrinally is going through this problem stating, but after 11, then all of a sudden he shifts over to personal application. And I know in the previous years when I used to teach this book, I never got this. I, I never saw it either. There's one that I was listening to his lecture on the book of Romans, and he said that when he was in school, in theology school, that the professor would stop at Romans 9. Wouldn't teach any further. And he was like, why, why are you not teaching past chapter 9? Oh, it's not important. Yeah, it is. Because honestly, 9 through 11 nails it. It crescendos the whole issue going on from after 11 and going to 12 to 16 it becomes a personal application so if you take the first eight chapters and just talk about the law and salvation and you know all these blessings of it and not bring in 9 through 11 you shatter the whole premise of this letter so let's go back to that so if Paul knew historically what was going on, hearing from Priscilla and Aquila, personal report, because they had been in Rome, came back, and then they had already, some had returned the next time that Paul is now hearing about what's going on in Rome. Phoebe is the one who carries this letter. So we know that people are communicating with him the status, just like we read Titus and Timothy as they would come to him and give report, and then he'd write a letter back, and they would carry that letter back. Something changed between the Priscilla and Aquila meeting, and then all of a sudden now, he's sitting back in Corinth, and there's something really bad going on with the Church of Rome, but he can't go. He's stuck. And I, I believe that it's this division between the Gentiles and the Christian Jews. And the issue is, People were superstitious. The Romans were very superstitious. And when I say the Gentiles in the context of this, I'm talking about the Romans. Romans believe that things just didn't happen by accident. There's karma. Their karma was a god. Somehow, you've done something to cause this to happen to you. And it probably was because you offended one of the pagan gods that they had. Well, you know... They always say, you know, you can take the redneck out of the country, but you can't take, you know, you can take him out of the country, but you can't take the redneck off him. He's still got it in him. And that's the Gentiles. They still have this. And so now, whenever, whenever this happens, that the Jews are expelled and they're blamed for all of this, it swept up Jewish Christians as well as the Jews. And looking at what they had been taught by the Jews themselves and seeing that now Mosaic Law was something that's not important anymore. And that listening to the story about Jesus, what happened? Those Jews murdered Him. They killed the Son of God. They rejected Him. And looking at all the conflict that was going on, and now they're, they're experiencing it before the expulsion of the Jews and how that they were rejecting. Their very leaders in those synagogues were rejecting Christ. And then all of a sudden, they're punished. They're thrown out. They did something. Something has happened to them. This is a little subjective, but I think it helps to be supported as we go through the theme of this. Because one of the larger pictures here is the idea of God's plan, God's choice, and what He is doing. And that's when we start talking about who is a Jew, when He talks about, He uses language like that. And then later on, we hear Him say, well, was the Word not effective? What happened? Well, you know, did, did He reject Israel? No! He did not reject Israel. And so He comes back, and then remember the very stern warning we're going to get to in 11, when He says, now remember... 
if God took that which was natural of the tree, Judaism, and broke that branch out and burned it and grafted that which is unnatural, you, O Gentile, and brought you into it, don't you think he can break you out and bring that branch back? And so I think that helped bracket for me this idea. And then the Jews thinking, well, and the, Jew, and the Gentiles as well saying, we're done with you, Jews. Israel, we're done with you. There's nothing good with you. And that's something that you'll see in this letter where, uh-uh, no, God's not done with him. And what you're calling Israel has a dual meaning. There's Israel and there's Israel. And a Gentile go, what? Yeah, there, there's a difference. There's the man who received the promise, Israel, and then there's the spiritual promise that even within Isaac, not all of Isaac's descendants received the blessing. And so that's where we'll get to that very difficult passage when he says something as bold as saying, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And it has to flow with that. I know I just perked your interest, didn't I? Because that's important when we come to this. So now, <laughs> let's jump in. So we're just going to do verses 1 through 17. I say just because there's so much with this introduction that is really helping again, I think, to tie the purpose behind why he wrote this letter. So he does a brief summary of the gospel, and this is really the one place that he nails it all together. And he doesn't do it in a traditional way, like I said, but he really nails the theme where he's going to talk about the gospel and that. And then he expresses his idea of wanting to come and to visit with them and his plans and what he expect, his expectations are when he gets there. And that's important as well, too, when we see that. So then we see him, the very last verses, we'll see where he talks about the gospel there. So let's go ahead and read 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are beloved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you pick up in there? Even in there, he starts to bring up this idea. Guys, this salvation is for everyone. I'm bringing this message. This is what I was doing. But look at this message. So in this idea, some of the translations, and I think this is a weakness kind of in the ESV, but again, we don't understand the other word. The, 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 the idea behind this in the Greek is bond servant. It's not a slave as one who doesn't have a choice, but it's one who doesn't have a choice because they have bound themselves of free will but they have no control. Paul is saying, I am bound as a servant to Jesus Christ. I'm out of control. I, I don't control what's going on. Whatever his will is, is what I'm going to do. Period. He also identifies himself as an apostle. And the idea that he has been sanctified, but we don't use that word, but that's really what it is, set apart. So his life, his special purpose that he has is all about the gospel of God. There's my drive. That's what I'm about. I'm about serving God, serving Jesus Christ and being his servant. That's what it's all about for me. In which he promised. Now this is where he starts to tie in the prophecies when he says, which he promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this is something that's not made up, it's not make-believe, this is something that is very serious that we're doing. And what is it concern? And if you think about it, the Holy Scriptures, he could have said a lot of things. Well, it spoke about Moses, spoke about Jacob, spoke about Samuel, spoke about the judges. No, 
specific. Let's get on target. He's saying it has to do with his son. That's what this whole thing was about. The whole plan of salvation was to bring out and bring this son as our savior. And what happened? He shows the flesh and the spirit in the next part of this. He says he's a descendant by flesh of David, tribe of Judah. That's where kings come from. Now, you notice in the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew writers dealing with making them priest and king, which is a struggle. Paul doesn't do that. He's showing his right, his sovereignty to be able to rule. So he has two ways that he shows. He de- declared to be the son of God, according to the power, to the spirit of holiness. And how did he do it? How did he accomplish it? By resurrection. By resurrection from the dead. And because of that, because of that, him being a descendant of David, prophesied about through the the prophets, that he has also been declared by God to be his son, we receive favor, grace, blessings, and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, not for my name, not to build me a church, but for his name. To who? All races. I think that would almost be a little more appropriate for our time. Because when we say nations, nationality, we, nationality is just, oh, okay, that, that's more of race, isn't it? Descended, where are you from? Are you Mexican? Are you Spaniard? Are you Central American? Are you English, Irish? Those are all nationalities. So that's what he's referring to. There's no boundary racial here, guys. And that's the problem they have. They are, they're now having this flux back and the Jews coming back in, the Gentiles not receiving them, and them looking at each other, and he's leveling the playing field, and that's what he's going to start out with. And he said, and so you are called to belong to that Christ. He brings them into that as well. To those who are in Rome, loved by God, called to be saints. So if you're quabbling with the guy sitting in the pew next to you because he's a Jew, first and foremost, he's your brother and he's a saint. All of you are the same when it comes to this. And it's peace, a reconciliation through there. So let's look now at 8 through 13. Read that. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I've been prevented. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of, notice he says this, Gentiles. I am under obligation. Why? He's a bondservant, he goes on to say. I am under obligation to both the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. That's what I've done. That's the purpose of it all. Now I'm eager. I've been trying to come. I can't. I'm I'm trying to get there. And so he identifies their reputation. They're a well-known church. There's a lot of well-known churches that are messed up, by the way, right? (laughs) They have problems. It doesn't make them perfect. We can read about them in the book of Revelations where there were some that, you know, were doctrinally straight, lost the love of God. So we can see that in there. And so then he says that he is wanting to continually ask for petitions from God for them. Now this is something that kind of struck me because I know I don't. How often do we pray for churches? Other churches. Now and then when I'm thinking about one or I'll I'll think of a brother or talk to one in that that church, you know, it reminds me. But I not something I really grew up doing. 
was praying specifically for churches. And look at Paul. He's never had anything to do with establishing them. But look at his heart. He's expressing something in there that he wants them and he's showing them that he's always involved in prayer and they're involved in his heart. He's not going to let them go. I long to see you. One, he may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Now, I don't know if the Holy Spirit has revealed to him that they're lacking something, which I don't think they are. So I'm not real sure, you know, exactly what he's meaning by this. Is this a spiritual gift through his, you know, uni, you know mutual uh, edification or something like that? But he knows that it's not going to be a one-way street. And that's what it's about, isn't it? Being brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, a, it's not about what I'm getting out of this. I'm going there because I'm going to really get it built up about this. No, we're both going to get something out of this. So to encourage the reader to be excited about the fact that Paul's actually kind of equalizing himself with us in our relationship, that we're going to give something to Paul. And I think we forget about that, that you know what? Your involvement in the church at all different levels is very encouraging and very needful. That's why the assembling together is so important. And so he's often tried to do this. He wants to do that, but he's been hindered. Now, this is what's interesting is the way he uses this language. And again, it's kind of something he doesn't always do it this way. And this is one of the reasons that I kind of failed to mention this. You'll recognize this phrase that he uses throughout here in the book of Romans is first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. This is a part of that reconciliation of this problem between the Jews and the Gentiles that I believe is going on in Rome. But look what he says. I'm under obligation to both the Greeks and the barbarians. That's different. He doesn't say to the Jew and the Gentile. So what's the Greek? The Greek were the educated. He doesn't say Roman. He doesn't give a specific nationality per se because a barbarian was a babbler. Anybody who didn't speak the language of Rome, you know, they were considered a babbler. Because that's what it sounded like when you listen to somebody in a foreign language. That's why I love that word. Blah, 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 blah. You, you, you hear it and it's like, is that Chinese? What, what is that? It's blah, 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 blah. And so they came up with that. So the, the Romans looked at anybody who wasn't intelligent or, or not intelligent. Let me, I got to rip that word out of there. Not intelligent, but did not speak the common language. They were barbarian. But to a Roman, one who was Greek cultured, now that, that person was wise. And they love, it's like our, our, you know, a lot of our society loves to send their kids to Harvard, to Princeton. Well, to get your kid to go to Athens or to be Greek trained in the philosophy and things like that and rhetoric was the top. And that's why it's interesting the way he says Greek and barbarian. The one that they look down upon, the wise here is the Greek. And then he, he's kind of redundant, but he simplifies it and says, to the wise and the foolish. I'm obligated to both. I'm not going to go there just for that. I'm, I'm doing both. And he says, preach the gospel to also those who are in Rome. This is where the gospel, and this is one of the most famous lines out of the entire book, is when he says in 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Ah, now that's, that's common. You know, we hear that a lot. We know that it's faith. It's faith. It's what saves us. It's not works. It's faith. But if you're somebody who's reading this, and if you're Jewish, ah, uh, Mosaic law works are weighing it. He's going to deal with that. But the idea of being ashamed is embarrassed. It's, it's an idea that, you know, somebody could be. If he's not ashamed, you can tell that there are some that are ashamed of the gospel. And that's something that I think we've got to think about is, does the gospel embarrass you sometimes? Well, of course not, Ron. It doesn't embarrass us. And why don't you talk about it more? You don't talk about things that you're ashamed of. Right? You don't talk about that wart on your nose. 
You don't talk about things that you don't want to talk about. You know, you don't talk about it. But things that you love, that you know that are important, can't stop talking about it. And you don't care what people think about it. The gospel was something that was kind of shameful and silly to those that were wise. Remember what Paul said to Corinth? He said those things in which God does, the world says is foolish. And if the world thinks it's foolish, probably even some Christians could start to think and be a little bit embarrassed and saying, yeah, our God, was, he took his son and he crucified him on the cross. And uh, yeah, he, but he was raised from the dead. You know, I mean, Paul says, I'm not ashamed because I know what it does. You should never be ashamed of something that saves people. There's nothing that can have the same impact for somebody. No way, no, no plan you could ever come up with is as perfect as this one. You can do all sorts of things to try to save somebody. A doctor could come up with all kinds of ways to plan to medically treat you and say, I can say, you'll never hear him say that, will they? Probability is you're going to be okay. But when it comes to salvation, he says, I know. And this is where he starts to come about the Jew first and to the Greek. Now, remember, the Jews just came back and they're having this conflict and the, the Gentiles are sitting there going, hey, stay on that side of the church building. You know, you no, no, you being punished for some reason and no, guess what, guys? Gentile, to the Jew first and then to the, gen, the Gentile, to the Jew first and the Gentile. Now, that's biblical because that's exactly what God promised because it was to first go and it was established with the tribe's that then carried forward the promise, started in Jerusalem, they were all Jewish, and then it went out. Even Jesus himself said in the Great Commission, he, give, he almost goes geographically and says, first, uh, you're going to take this word, and it's going to go into Judea, then out to Samaria, and then to the whole world. So that was the point. First, though, where did it go? Remember Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman? And she said, you know, would you please, you know, perform this miracle? And he goes, no, 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 it's not for the Samaritans. It's for the Jews. And he ends up helping her. But there's a lesson there as well. Another point, just like what Paul is also trying to say this. Faith to faith has been a very difficult passage to try to figure out with people when you're reading. I mean, it can mean a lot of things. There's nothing that definitely sets this up. But when you look at it, to me, it's not handed down. This is my... This is just my humble opinion of this. I think it's kind of a little maybe common sense about it. But to the Jew, it was works. It was carrying out, and that's how you pass that on. It was works to works to works to works to generation to works. You taught the kids to do the works of the Mosaic Law, and then works and works. Uh Uh-uh. He's saying, no. It went from faith of Abraham to faith of Isaac to faith of Jacob, to faith of then down to Judah, to faith, and it, that's what he's saying, from faith to faith. Because they had to believe. Whenever he told Abraham, pick it up, move. Faith. He did it. So I believe that's what he's saying here. He's saying it's not works to works, to circumcision, to Mosaic law, to sacrifice, to works. No, 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 no. It's faith. And then faith. Faith is what has brought it down to even you and I to this day. So that's the first section that we looked at. I hope that you'll read ahead, read back, pull that in. If you can, between now and next week, read all the way up to 11. Read through there and try to see the way he flows. Now, there's going to be some, I call them speed bumps, little bumps you're going to hit and go, it's going to slow you down. Don't let that happen. Just keep moving through it. But look at the idea that where he's showing the reconciliation of the Jew and the Gentile, the equality of it, and God's sovereign right to execute his plan the way he has chosen. And that it's not about hating in the way we think, but it's the way God has chose to deliver his plan of salvation. If you're here with us this evening and there's something that we can do to help you in your relationship with him, I hope you'll take this moment while we sing this invitation song to evaluate the way you've been walking with God. 
If there's anything else we can do, I hope that you would as well. If you're comfortable, come forward while we now stand and sing the invitation song. Who at my door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are calling, Open the door for me, if thou wilt heed my calling, I will abide with thee. Lonely without he staying, lonely within am I. <clears throat> While I am still delaying, I am condemned to die. Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door. 